calling you to a higher place of praise. Oh, it becomes my highest praise when all that I am responds to who you are. It becomes my Just to know you more oh, It becomes my highest praise Glory to God I trust the Lord to be able to lay a systematic introduction this morning Psalm 50 from verse 1 <clears throat> Psalm 50 from verse 1, the mighty God, even the Lord hath spoken. Psalm 50 from verse 1, I'll read to verse 7. Please, when you get home, read the entire psalm. Very important, some things I'm going to. Um, call your attention to the mighty God even the Lord had spoken and he called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof out of Zion the perfection of beauty God had signed and how did he sign verse 3 our God shall come and shall not keep silence a fire shall devour before him and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. Verse 4. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Verse 5. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me, how? By sacrifice. And the heavens shall declare his righteousness for God is judge himself then the psalmist wrote the word sila that means pause and think verse 7 and we'll go back and think about these things here all my people and i will speak oh israel and i testify against thee i am god even thy god please hold that thought from that verse and hop with me to hebrews chapter 12 hebrews chapter 12 From verse 18. For ye are not come. Please look at me. Just look at me. Once I hit the word for in scripture, I naturally step back. The reason is because it means that there is a thought that is coming from. So step back two verses and see something. Because you know, especially with this scripture, we're so used to beginning it from verse 18. For you are not come to the mountain that cannot be touched. That's if you manage to start it from here. Most people start from verse 21, but you are come unto Mount Zion. Right? Step back two verses to verse 16. 15, 15, 15. Look at this. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. How does he fail? Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Verse 16. Ah. Lest there be any fornicator or any profane person. So notice he wants you against three things. He wants you against the root of bitterness. He wants you against fornication and then he wants you against profanity. And he says to you that what profanity does is that like Esau for a morsel of meat, you will sell your birthright. Then verse 17, look at this. For you know. How that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, 
That means in the day of the trade was not the day of the effect. For you can see that afterward, in the day of the inheritance, that means the day of the inheritance is a day of, that is preserved in God. And yet, the day a man denies his inheritance is not in the day of the inheritance. Afterward, when he would have received a blessing, he was rejected. And at the point when he would have received a blessing, look at this, for he found no place of repentance. That means in the day of the blessing, there's no space for repentance. So blessed are they that repent before the day of the blessing. Please follow. Blessed are they that repent before the day of the blessing. Because in the day of the blessing, you will now realize that the climax of all pursuit is what was standing in front of you. And no root of bitterness, no fornication, or no profanity was worth standing in that day and not qualifying for the blessing. The Bible says there was no place of repentance found for him even though he was now seeking it with tears. Then verse 18 said, For. Okay. I thought something had happened inside you. For you are not come unto a mount that cannot be touched. That means that the entire story from this point to the end of the chapter, listen to this, that entire story was actually the story of laying hold on an inheritance. So the entire concept of Zion is a concept of laying hold on an inheritance. Please follow me. He said, for you are not come unto a mountain that cannot be touched. And that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. We read it in Exodus 19. That's why I read it earlier. Next verse. We have not come to the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words which they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. Next verse. For they could not endure. Hold on to the word endure. I think I should use my Bible. They are not moving at my pace. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with the darts. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Verse 22. But ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, To the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven and to God the judge of all and to the spirits of just men what made perfect and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of the sprinkling that does what that speaketh better things than that of Abel wait he brings in Abel having spoken about Esau. And you remember that Abel was actually the one who God delighted in his sacrifice. But Esau was now the one who by profanity denied inheritance. Alright? You remember that Cain killed Abel and went on to build kingdoms. Please follow me. You need a lot of these descriptions vividly arranged in your minds. So that by the time we are done laying this, you will be able to see clearly that speak at better things than the blood of Abel. Verse 25. First few words here. See that you refuse not him that speak it. That means as Esau was profane, as Cain was profane, because both Esau and Cain refused the one who spake. And the consequence every time 
was that they were denied an inheritance. Ah. Follow me. Both Cain and Esau refused. You remember that Cain, God literally came to Cain while Cain was developing his anger. And God asked Cain, why are you angry? He said, for if you have done right, would you not have also been accepted? That means that God was not going to pick and choose whose sacrifice he was going to accept. Come on, come on, come on. He wasn't going to pick and choose whose sacrifice he was going to accept. So, both Cain and Abel could have been accepted. Just like both Esau and Jacob could have been accepted. Now, let me tell you something you should keep on the side. You will find out that many times when scripture speaks about the establishment of Zion, what scripture seems to be coming against consistently is Edom. And Edom is the lineage of Esau. Take note of it. Obadiah chapter 1 told you that upon Mount Zion there shall be deliverance and holiness and the children of Jacob shall possess their possession. He said, and in that day, Jacob will be a fire, Israel will be a flame, and they will consume the house of Esau. That means, listen to this, in the day of the appearance of Zion, and I'm going to take the time to show you that out of Psalm 50. In the day of the appearance of Zion, there is one who should have inherited with him, who by profanity did not cleanse themselves from the root of bitterness, from fornication, and from profanity. And that the greatest challenge in the day of possessing the mountain of God will not be the hidden. It will be Edom. Please follow me. Follow. Do you realize that that's why immediately afterwards in Obadiah chapter 1, the Bible says, and saviors shall arise from Mount Zion and they shall judge the Mount of Israel. You also realize right now that what Psalm 50 said is that the Bible says the mighty God, the Lord speaks. He calls to the earth from the east to the west or from the rising of the sun to his setting. And the Bible says in verse 3 that God sits to judge among his people. That means that the first judgment of Zion is not against the nations. Please follow me. You will understand it. So that every time you speak about Zion, something must come alive inside of you. The Bible says, verse 25 again, Hebrews 12, 25. Just read down with me and then I will take the time and lay out as I trust the Spirit of God to give you a beautiful picture of what I believe God is saying to us in this season. Look at this. See that you refuse not him that speaks. Not that spoke. Not that speak. But that speaks. That means he is still speaking. Alright? For if they escape not who refused him that speak on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaks from heaven. Next verse. Whose voice then shook the earth but now he had promised saying yet once more i seek not the earth only but also heaven next verse and this word yet once more signifies the removing of the, those things that are shaken as of the things that are made that those things which cannot be shaken may remain next verse uh wherefore we receiving oh come on come on receiving which cannot be moved let us have grace 
whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire. Now, let me lay three ground rules for my teachings today and tomorrow. Please hear this carefully. You know, in the last three, four years, one of the emphasis God gave me is the like and the ask of scripture. You remember that? And I told you that you must be careful with the like and the ask of scripture. Because in the like and the ask of scripture is the measure of God's expectation. And that if you miss the like and the ask of scripture, what will happen is that you will create for yourself, listen to this, the standard definition of what scripture is speaking. Hear me carefully. You will create for yourself the standard or definition of what scripture is speaking that is less than God's expectation. So let's do two classical examples of that, right? You shall love one another as I have loved you. So Myro, if I take away the word as from there, what happens is I will do my best to love you and trust the grace of Jesus to help me love you. Except that the moment the word as is introduced there, I know that I have not arrived at love until I can love you the way Jesus loves me. Is anybody still here? The earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the seas. That means with all our travels, Abbe, with all of the nations we have gone to, the target is not how many nations we can reach. The target is that our eyes must be lifted to check if the earth is covered with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Until we see that day, there's no relenting. Because the moment us is introduced, the right to determine extent is now taken away from you. You now have to understand that you have not arrived at God's standard of righteousness, meaning you have not justified the grace of God until your ass is the ass of scripture. Does it make sense? You shall be perfect even as your heavenly father is perfect. Now, those are revolutionary thinkings. But in the most recent times, the Lord began to call my attention to something I want to add to the like us principle. Please hear me carefully. Because if you don't get this, you will find it a very tough assignment to conceptualize Zion and begin to build in cooperation with God to see that his end arrives. I said I'm laying ground rules for my teachings. Now listen to this. The Lord began to say to me recently, you must in the study of scripture, like you did with the like and ask of scripture, listen to this, you must in the study of scripture, Pastor Dan, find the ultimate purpose of God. Because if you don't find the ultimate purpose of God, you will dwell in the achievements of the pathways of God and never arrive at fulfilling the vision of God. Please look at this. I'm the way, Pastor A. Pastor A, please stand on your diet. Look at this. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Now look at this. That means that the assignment of Jesus is to introduce men. Follow me. You'll see this. The assignment of Jesus is to introduce men to the Father. That means Jesus becomes hurt and broken. John 14. If a man meets him and is asking about the Father. Look at this. Because if a man meets Jesus and the man is asking about the Father, it means that Jesus has not done a good job in representing who the father is. So if one man, David, come, 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 come. If one man meets Jesus, look at this, 
what he sees in Jesus are two things. Number one, in Christ dwells the full of the Godhead bodily. Look at this. That means he's looking at Jesus and seeing the full posture of the Father. But Jesus will become a judgment for him if he does not see the ladders of ascension in Jesus. Oh, are you following me? So that Jesus as the truth. Ephesians chapter 4 told you, and teaching the truth in love may grow, not may become. And teaching the truth in love may grow up into him. That means when you see him, you are seeing a full stature. If you look at him and look at yourself, you feel condemned. But the problem with the beauty of Jesus is that as you behold him, while you are still looking at the stature, you are also seeing the ladder. So, though he is the completeness of the Father, you are seeing that from what you are seeing, if you take the next step, you are closer. Yes, sir. And you take the next step, you are closer. And you take the next step, you are closer. And you take the next step, you are closer. So that by the time you meet here, you, Jesus, and the Father are one. No, wait, wait, wait. The Lord Jesus prayed in John 17. He said, Father, as you and I are one, that you make them one in us. So the ultimate arrival of the journey is until I look at myself and say, as Jesus is, so I am. And the Bible says that's what gives me boldness in the day of judgment. Follow carefully. Because if you don't understand this, now what could have happened is he could have come to Jesus because he wants to live a clean life. Look at this. And let's say a clean life is the fourth step from here. And this is the problem with scripture. Ask, it will be given to you. Seek, you will find. Knock, and the door shall be opened. By the law of expectation, God only owes you what you seek. The only other thing God owes you is the revelation of more. Oh, oh, shh. I've seen better. Can't go back to less. Now I desire deeper places, Lord, in you. Tasted better. And I know there's more. Now I desire deeper places, Lord, in you. Uh, let's not sing the whole day. Look at this. Look at this. So, he wakes up and what he wants is he wants to arrive at a sense of cleanliness in his life's conduct that permits him the right to speak judgment into others. You see, that's why, sir, the church must be careful what Jesus we posture to those who we seek to introduce to Jesus. Because if they enter an environment where our sense of attainment seems to give us right over the flock that we did not die for. What then happens is that the incubator that incubates them forms the purpose of the vision they see. The problem with the purpose of that vision, hear me carefully, is the fact that it becomes even difficult for God to introduce them to more because everything they saw when they came did not look like more. Now that's why when the man arrives at the fullness of what you have journeyed, if God sees a true test in the heart of that man, what he will do is he has to relocate that man so that his journey can continue. Follow the story of Zion. Because if you don't understand the story of Zion, Zion will quickly become a concept. I love the worship of Zion. And what a blessing we had this morning. Did you see how these men in their various giftings just opened up the vistas of heaven and opened up an atmosphere here? Don't worry. Where I'm going to is I'm saying to you that you see that place that they took us to is a pathway to somewhere. If you are not careful, you will dwell in this place and not produce the outcomes. Let's go. Let's go. 
You'll see. That's an absolute necessity in the journey. But how you know Zion has come is that kings arise. I'm coming. You see it. So you will cherish their ministry a lot more when you understand where their ministry was designed to introduce you to. If not, what will happen is that we'll finish World and Worship Conference and every time they say, Zion, you just go. Because you are thinking of Zion as an atmosphere. God is thinking of Zion as a commissioner. I'm coming. An ultimate, there's an ultimate end. So the Lord began to say to me recently that every time you read scripture, you must by study. Please, hear me carefully. You must by study. By intentional study. Look for the end of God. If not, what will happen is that you will find the pathways of God so beautiful, they will look like places to dwell in. That's what I found out about Abraham's journey of faith. The Bible says, for if they had remembered the city from which they came, they would have had reasons to return. And that's the deep painful lesson in Terah's life. Because the Bible told you that Abraham's father set out to go to Canaan. Then he arrived at all the Chaldeans. And the city was beautiful. The city was productive. If you read that story properly, you would find out that Abraham's father wasn't doing badly. He had journeyed to a place that seemed to have fulfilled everything his vision gave him. So there was no need to continue the journey until Canaan. So holiness is good. Except that holiness is not an end. Are you hearing me? I just read it for you out of Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews chapter 12, the Bible told you three things to beware of. Told you to beware of the root of bitterness. He told you beware of fornication. And he told you beware of profanity. Because these three consistently war against an inheritance. And Zion is an inheritance. You will see it. So, if his target is to arrive at cleanliness in lifestyle, that grants him the permission to without conscience judge. If I take him by the hand, one, two, three, four steps. The moment he arrives here, by the power of sight, he becomes limited. And he dwells here as an end. Listen. There is the implication of this personally. There's the implication of this generationally. Listen, and I say this as one who has been granted grace to say it. And I think that I've arrived at the natural stature. When I say natural stature, I'm speaking about physically. In the things that people count. I think I've arrived there naturally to be able to throw out this warning. Please be careful with the prosperity that comes with the need to administrate the seasons of God on the earth because that prosperity can become a plateau. I used my words very carefully. The prosperity that comes with the need to administrate. Because you see, none of us started this journey with large buildings, with lights, with screens, with sounds, with demands, with we didn't start it that way. There's a point you get to where administrating these things can become the end of the journey. And the moment we arrive at the place where administrating these things become the end of the journey, God is forced to look within us. This is normally where Esau is born. Because God is forced to look within us. God will not go back here.
God won't go back here. He will come to all of the Chaldeans. And call Abraham out of you. Understand this? That's why Abraham too was wise enough to say to Isaac, to say to Eliezer, put your hands in between my laps and swear to me by the Lord God that you will not take among these people. Because while Abraham was dwelling in their lands, he was dwelling in his inheritance. You will soon see it that when Zion arrives at the promise, it has to dispossess an existing culture. Are you following me? So the culture of where you arrive at, you cannot join it. Because in the natural, there will be physical measures that tell you have attained a status. And the problem is not cross-carpeting cultures because if God is giving me the land of the Canaanites, the Canaanites must be wiser than me. I, I wish I was talking to a congregation that understands me right now. The natural philosophy. Oh, you are forcing me to go ahead of myself. The lands that God promised them when he showed up in Exodus chapter 19, I mean the entire book, but in Exodus chapter 19, he said, I bore you upon eagle's wings and I brought you to myself. And the idea of bringing you to myself is to make you my people before I give you my land. But the land he was going to give them was not empty. It was the land of the Canaanites. And ultimately, what you will find as Zion was the land of the Jebusites. And I'm coming there. That means the tendency. Do you now see why God rebuked the first generation of spies? Because the first generation of spies entered into the land, saw the land as God has promised, but saw the people as superior. That means we can't dispossess these people. They are stronger than us. They are better than us. Simply put, their philosophy, their God is superior to the God of Zion. That's when God said, Moses, you know what? Let me kill these people. No, go and read it. That's when God literally said, Moses, you know what? Let me kill these people. There's no deal here. Listen, but there were some wilderness babies that Joshua sent later. Those are the wilderness babies that ended up in the house of Rahab. You remember them? Those ones did not discuss the fortification of the walls of Jericho. Those ones said, when the Lord surely gives us the land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Understand this. Those ones said, when the Lord surely gives us the land. If you and your family are hiding here and you can throw the scarlet thread across the window, then we guarantee. Imagine these boys. No. no. On, on behalf of Joshua and Yahweh. No, no, no you didn't get it. They were not even sure what strategy Yahweh was going to use to take Jericho. But they said to her, if you understand the covenant of the blood and not to put it on your window, the same way he passed over us, he will pass over you. That means this generation had imbibed the cultures that that last generation had failed to imbibe. The cultures of understanding how God operates. Many years ago, I think it was one of Baba's first teachings I heard. No, it wasn't first, but some talk. He said, the walls of Jericho did not fall, my friends. A dog held up a person. Because Rahab laid them out from her window. That means Rahab's house was built in the walls of Jericho. But covenant had promised her 
she will not be touched. That means while the walls of Jericho fell down flat, there must have been one straight strip that refused to fall. Because when I see the blood, I will pass over you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Let's look at this very carefully. Look at this carefully. I was speaking about the need to administrate the present prosperity. And I have begged God to take God life from me. If God life will take my inheritance. <laughs> I have begged God. I told him, see this God life assembly, this, this thing. This is what the world knows me for, Abi. This God life assembly. Lord, if administrating God life will not permit me to continue my journey, because you wake up every day, there's a bill. You wake up every day, there's one case. You wake up every day, there's somebody to answer. You wake up every day, there, there is a name in the public space. You wake up every day, there's a way you want to carry yourself because you are conscious that you wake up every day. And what you do not know is that each of these administrations are eating up worship space in your mind. That's why you must understand the rivers are refreshing enough. So that every time you enter an atmosphere like this and a gusher is hit, forget who you are and lie down under a chair. And you will see that after you lie down under the chair, be sure that you refuse not him that speak. Because you must rise up from there willing to dismount everything to obey the next instruction. That's why the Bible speaks about the heritage of faith in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he told you that he lived in tents with Isaac and Jacob. The heirs with him of the promise. It was always about the promise. So Abraham had become as strong as a nation. But will never administrate buildings. He would rather dwell in tents. Follow me. Zion is the story. Some of you have not started your journey. Administration is killing. Sometimes your problem, your administration is family. You know that miracle you believe God for. Let me marry. Now you have married. Then administrating marriage. Some of you is your first album they have heard. You have invited you in three places. Now you are packaging yours. What you do not know is that that administration is stealing a journey from you. When I see the love, I will pass. Make sure in every time when we give these breathers. When we create these sealers, we're not singing a familiar song. We're giving you an opportunity to unclutter. I will pass over you. When I see the blow, I will pass over you when I see the blood 
I will pass over you. In every season, you must make sure your obediences are more than your administrations. In every season, you must be sure that your obediences are more than your administrations. Because those things you are trying to administrate and steward and package, as surely as they eat more space in your mind than the voice of the Lord, what is happening is that you have arrived at a point in the journey that is not the destination but has become seemingly satisfactory. And believe me, too many people have lost their journey at this point. I said to you, it is at this point Esau is created. Let me tell you, Esau is not the man that God compels out of here. Because God will always compel a man out of here. He will always compel a man out of here. Now when that man is compelled out of here, the man that is left behind, that sees that guy in the continuous journey of what he stopped, becomes the greatest opposition. Because like the old prophet, he understands what the voice of God sounds like. But he's wondering how God is not speaking to him because he dwelt in the city where God sent the young prophet to. Oh no, you didn't get it. That means for God to send a young prophet into that city, it means that somehow he has become encumbered with administrating the biggest prophet in town. So his obediences were dying. But his administration was intact. Because man, you could still see that they referred to that older prophet. They told him a younger prophet came. That means as far as they were concerned, a prophet should not enter into town and not come and greet you. And administrating that position made that God saw how complacent he was and knew that this message cannot be delivered by you. So God takes one from outside and then he brings him. And the moment this guy hears the sound of the new guy, he by the stature of his administration speak or leave a He's speaking to this younger guy. And the moment that younger guy did what the older guy said, the destruction of the Lord hit the younger. Please, in every season, be sure that your obediences supersede your administrations. If it looks like God has dwelt in a place for too long, ask him, Lord, ah, what's next? You have not spoken to me about any city. Lord, uh -uh. you have not given me an assignment. Lord, uh -uh. Lord, what's happening? Because God has to begin to uncumber you and bring you to the place where you are free enough to continue this journey. Now that's why the Lord Jesus in introducing the next step, look at this. For instance, he starts to tell us, your next step is your financial prosperity look at this carefully and then you create a good picture of your financial prosperity in your mind listen your word is a lamp unto my feet but it must also be a light that means every next thing God is introducing you to you must be introduced in the light of where God is ultimately going So every time you open scripture, don't only find what God is doing next. Find where he is going to ultimately. If not, what will happen is that by the time he does you financial prosperity, it becomes the reason why everybody is at your feet. Your relatives are at your feet. Even your church is at your feet. Met a man on a flight recently. 
who told me that he had stopped giving his 1% to his church. 1%, not tight. 1%. He said he had a covenant with God before God made him rich. That God made him rich, you give him 1%. He didn't know tight. Then he said that that 1% self, that right now, for the last how many months, he has not given it to his church. He said because he does not understand what his bishop is doing with it. You understand what you are doing with the 99%. But you don't understand what your bishop is doing with the 1%. He said, because there are projects that the bishop told them they are going to do, and he gave money. So I sat down and I said to him, from the standpoint of a church leader and administrator, there are many details you possibly are not aware of. I won't sit down here and condemn your bishop with you. He was my companion on a flight. It was a six-hour flight from the UK. I said to him, there are solid details that your bishop doesn't know. But let me say something to you. Just in case your bishop is a thief. Is he not worthy of your 1%? He's a thief because you have not taken care of him. Yes. Because you are concerned what your bishop is doing with your 1%. And nobody is watching over your life to see what you are doing with your 99 It is when God brings you to that financial prosperity that you now realize you are a king. There's nothing else to move into because you now have money. And you need to administrate that money. Six times a day, you are on a calculator calculating how much has come in. No, the problem is that you are built... I built a solid structure on the pathways of God. Let me say this so that these men of God can sit down. Listen to me very carefully. The pathways of God are valid, but they must never end our journey. Please sit down, sir. Let me continue on this teaching. What did I say? The pathways of God they are valid, but they must never end that journey. Please hold that as a rule of thumb in this teaching. So, in reading the scriptures now, I've become a little careful with words like that. I'll give you an example. Put Ephesians chapter 1 verse 10 on the board. Ephesians 1 10. Come on, come on, come on now. Ephesians 1 verse 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are and that means everything else he said before this was so that he can do this. Now let's go back and see everything else he said before this. One, three. One, three, blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus according as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be an un, in, uh -huh, having yes according to the good pleasure of his will, next verse, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved, verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, verse 8, wherein he had appointed to us in all wisdom and prudence, verse 9, having made unto us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure of his will that he proposed in himself, so that... No, you didn't get it. Let's go back. Number one, your seated position in Christ Jesus is so that. Number two, verse four, verse four, verse four. Four, 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 verse four. Your choice in God before the foundation of the world is so that. Your holiness and being without blemish is so that. Next verse. Uh, 
your predestination unto adoption. Adoption is arriving at the full stature of Jesus. It's so that. Next verse. Six. Look at this. Your acceptance in Jesus is so that. Verse seven. No, look at it. Now you see, I can speak acceptance. I'm accepted in the beloved. And it sounds like an end. I can speak seated position at the right hand of the Father. And it sounds like an end. So that I rejoice at it as an end. But I never generate the energy of it to arrive at the true end. What is the true end? So that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he wants to gather everything into Christ. That means my seated position is so that he can gather things into Christ. He, my choice by predestination is so that can. That means if I now find my choice in predestination and I'm not helping to gather things into Christ, in obedience to Christ, you understand? If you understand this, every new resource, every new dis discovery, every new knowledge, every new revelation, every new encounter, every new altar, whatever it is that is new that you find, what you will do is you will not just celebrate it, you will mobilize it for the end. I, I read scripture and I found out that Paul wrote concerning Israel he said for I bear them record that they have zeal but their zeal is not according to knowledge then I look at my generation and I bear them witness that they have knowledge but their knowledge does not generate zeal no 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 do you understand this so Israel was running off to do but were not accurate in their knowledge so what you are now thinking is that as knowledge increases zeal should increase with it because that's actually what is accurate that as i know god better the zeal to share god should increase my problem is that we now have a generation that is locked in the holy of holies ascending ascensions seven mountains every day the problem is that when we come out, we don't feel the need to share the God we met on the mountain. So if the so that are lost, the essence of the entire journey becomes grounded. Let me say this to you so that you can register. It is Satan the master of cunningness that made sure listen to this that we are ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth so that at some point even learning becomes our excitement so you are in every meeting where every new revelation is being shared The problem is that the last set of revelations did not convert into so that. So God does all of this. We embrace all of this, but never arrive at the so that of God. Now, I gave you that so that you can add to your like and ask journey that. And there are certain darts that you will find in scripture that are darts that lead to a further dart. So that I don't leave the message, let's leave it there. Now, listen to this. That means, especially if God has brought you under my shepherding, in the next season, what you need to master is you need to master the ultimates of the journeys of God. There are two things he does for you. He dismantles every form of pride. 
Because every pride is related to attainment. Are you following me? And until we have attained God's fullness, there's no, do you understand it? I cannot be on my way to Lagos and park in Quantagora and rejoice. I can park in Quantagora to eat and stretch my legs. Is somebody hearing me? But after that stretching of legs, in fact, there's such a limit to how long my legs can stretch. Because I cannot be found in Contagora three hours later still stretching. So my brain has told my legs, this stretch is 15 minutes. Because when we speak about Zion, you will see the ultimate journeys of God. God is on his way to building a city. God is on his way to building a city. Please follow. Now I need you to hold that in your heart. I said to do two things. It will dismantle all forms of pride. Number two. It will keep your zeal alive until this journey finishes. By that it means you will not create for yourself an end that is not the end of God. And I told you that by the law of expectation, once what you expect is delivered to you, you rest. You will notice that recently there's been, you know, some craze. Somebody get up from London and say, I'm going to go to Africa on my machine. And you're wondering how he's going to do it. It's simple. It's the law of expectation. His expectation will drive him there. Oh, you didn't get it. So he's passing through maybe like 24 countries in between. Each of these countries, he snaps a picture, gets an experience, buys one cowrie, buys one bag. But while as he's buying it, he puts it on the machine and strikes it again. And it's going on. By the time he drives, when he enters, welcome into Nigeria. Let me tell you what happens naturally in your mind. You suddenly realize that strength has finished. Uh, that means the concept of strength is a lie. I cannot is a limitation of your mind. It's because of what you have informed your mind you can take. That's why God calls you to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the Bible tells you to renew your mind in, according to the image of him that created you. That means that the first journey in walking with God is creating the possibilities for his speaking. That means the moment God speaks, before you get up to do, you must widen the concept of possibility within your mind. If not, what you will find out is that you will be growing weak and weary. Hey. I'm coming. So God meets you with 10 million naira in your account and he gives you a project that requires 10 billion. The first natural thought is God wants to kill me. Is that not correct? Because no matter how hard you steward or administrate your 10 million, it cannot finish the journey. If you don't widen possibilities in your mind, what will happen is that that journey will never start and none of us will know you are in disobedience. Those are the disobediences I fear. I don't fear the disobedience of fornication. No, I don't fear the disobedience of lying because that one can be found out. And if it's found out, brethren will help you. If brethren do not help you, condemnation will help you. Oh, you didn't get it. Are you following me? Judgment will help you. If, the, you will, if you are doing that type, you have to be hiding. You will become a CIA agent. You have to be hiding every move you make. No, no, you, do you understand what I'm saying? But there's the one that you can see with your head up. You are still a brother as far as we are concerned. The only problem is that it was two years ago God told you to move to a new city. Hmm. 
please I need you to keep that in your mind because of the next step of things I want to say concerning this entire thing so the first time you find the concept of Zion within earthly context because Zion seemed to have been a word introduced in scripture by David if you understand what I mean David was the one who introduced the concept of Zion please follow me in 2nd Samuel chapter 5 give me 2nd Samuel chapter 5 from verse 6 are you tired no you cannot be tired now we're about to ascend <laughs> now before you read I challenge you please make sure you are taking note of these things the problem with the teaching ministry is you need to be able to settle down and trust God for sufficient power to keep the minds of the people active because many things if you have to lay line upon line will take like 12 hours to do so believe me, this is me attempting to compress 12 hours into 2 hours. Because I have like 3 or 4 12 hours I need to finish in one conference. Please listen to me very carefully. So what we do is we throw you assignments that make that the sermon is never complete if you don't do it. Now go back to God's promise to Abraham and all of the promise God made as he repeated it continuously to Moses. Hear this carefully. The lands that I swore your, to your father's bring, the land of the Canaanites, the land of the Amorites, the land of the Hittites, the land of the Perizzites, the land of the... And the land of the Jebusites. The Jebusites were always mentioned last. Please make sure you check it. Every time God did that chronicle, the Jebusites were always mentioned last. Let me also call to your attention now, because it's been a while since we read it. Exodus 19. How I bore you on eagle's wings. Don't touch my sound. Take it back to where it was and leave that place. How I bore you on eagle's wings and I brought you to myself. Please listen to this. Look at this. You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagle's wings and brought you unto myself. Next verse. Verse 5. Quickly. Now therefore, if, please hold this in your mind, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then shall you be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people for all the earth is mine. Hear this carefully. That means God has the right to choose a set of people from all the people on the earth. And he used the journey of Israel to show you that God can separate a people from people. Right? And make them a peculiar treasure unto himself. Next verse. And you shall be unto me what? And you shall be unto me what? A kingdom of priests and an holy nation. Oh, these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Please stop. That means the journey for Israel is not complete until they become a peculiar treasure, a nation of kings. And priests now please follow me are you still here that means as far as God is concerned the journey was not land the journey was so that obedience can produce a peculiar people who are treasured by God above all other people on earth and those people are treasured by God because they have become a kingdom or priests that means this whole story that means this whole story 
is never about deliverance from Egypt. Oh, you didn't get it. A generation becomes too captivity conscious that it celebrates deliverance and never arrive at the promise. Everyone who died in the wilderness died because they sought deliverance from their captivity more than they sought the inheritance. Please take note. So in Genesis, in Exodus 19, what was God's declaration of intent? Two things I've shown you right now. Always ended with the Jebusites. Bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself because I intend that by obedience you will become a nation. A peculiar people above all the people of the earth. That means at that point it becomes God's right to be partial towards you. Because he has set you apart by obedience, by obedience, by obedience. If you hearken unto my voice, indeed. I'm emphasizing it because you need it for this journey. If not, you will be taken by the frenzy of your word you do not understand. So look at this. And I'll make you a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. God said, these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. That's what he said to Moses. So, look at this. So Moses failed and Moses still said it. Because of course, God didn't even permit Moses to enter into the promised land. Now you need to hold your chair tightly. Joshua failed and Joshua said it. Let me say what will sound offensive, Abbe. Moses was a man of the presence and he failed. Joshua was a man of the presence and he failed. Mm. I'm coming. Are we? Ah, yeah. Within the context of Zion, listen to this. The presence is not enough. I know you are wondering, yeah? So, Jephthah, what is enough? Because Moses is still worshipped in Israel. In fact, that Jesus dared to compare himself to Moses was one of the offenses that they used to kill him. Of course, you knew that throughout that story, every time Moses ascended, only Joshua came near. And Joshua said when he was dying, he said, see, I'm about to die. And there are yet many lands. Now let me tell you the problem Israel had. Because they were deliverance conscious, when they arrived at the promised land, they were looking for a place to rest, not a place to conquer. So if all our tribes have found a place to rest, listen to this carefully. If all our tribes have found a place to rest, it doesn't matter if the full cartographical map that God gave for the land of Israel is captured. As surely as we have a space to rest. All right. I'm talking about something here right now. That means that if it's Zion you are going for, you cannot be looking for your portion in Zion. You can only be looking for the king's glory from Zion. Because if you seek your portion in Zion, Zion is so resourced, it is so rich, it takes Zion nothing to bequeath to a portion. If one person is still alive, I'm all right. That means, if it's Zion you pursue, and I'm coming there, if it's Zion you pursue, you must be conscious that Zion is too resourced for me to be looking for my portion in Zion. The 
The pursuit of Zion is one, the king's glory. Until everything he intended to take is taken, I cannot rest. Now, this is the next thing I'm going to speak about. Please be guarding these pieces together. They will come together in a moment. Second Samuel chapter 5 from verse 6. Second Samuel 5 from verse 6. 6, 6, 6, 6, 6, 6, 6. I have 7 on my board. Ah, go back. Uh, okay. Second Samuel 5, 5. In Hebron, he, David, reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 30 and three years over all Israel and Judah. Next verse. And the king and his men went to what? Jerusalem unto the... That means the Jebusites as at this time were in control of what you now know as Jerusalem. Follow the story. The inhabitants of the land are unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which speak unto David, saying, except you take away our blind people and our lame people, you cannot enter. Mm. Let me tell you the insult. I need to come down on this one. Let me tell you the insult. What they are saying. There were two cities that when Israel took, the cities never moved. They, I mean, they were not, before Israel took them, they were not moved. First was Jericho. Because if people were going around your land for seven days, you should have been preparing for war. Mm. Are you following me? You should have been preparing for war. But the system around Jericho was too strong, too fortified. Jericho, I like the way Baba used to describe it. That the women in Jericho were still washing plates. The men were still playing. Then they would be hearing Israel. Cree, 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 around the walls. And they are thinking to themselves, when you are tired, you will go. Because the walls of Jericho were the security of Jericho. Please listen to me very carefully. And Jericho trusted that security so much. The instruction Israel had was not their business. Until after seven days, it came down. Now listen to this. I've done this teaching before in church. I need to do it again. Psalm 125. Let me show you why the Jebusite said that David cannot come here. Even our blind and our lame people will resist David. No, no. The king of, Jer of Jebus said concerning Jerusalem. Now, don't forget that at this time, Jerusalem was not in Israel. That means what Moses didn't do, what Joshua didn't do, no generation did it until David came. And don't forget that Zebus was the last of the inheritance. And if Zebus is taken, then God can establish Zion. I just jumped ahead of myself. Now, so David got up, not because he lacked land, but because he knew covenant. So he knew that because this is part of the promise, we must take it. Now, listen. The Bible said, they that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abided forever. As the mountains around about Jerusalem, so the Lord is from so. Jebus knew that they had a fortification and it was the mountains. You are in Joss, so you should be able to relate with this. 
Usman Dalfonius Jihad died around these mountains. The mountains that mark the plateau actually reveals the places where Usman Danfodio could not ascend onto. That's why Islam didn't get here. Our people could fight them back with stones from the hilltops. You cannot sit in plateau and not understand the concept Zion. I'm coming there. The Jebusites were too fortified. They were, they were not surrounded by a brick wall. They were surrounded by mountains. I'm coming. Please hear this. In the order of God, please hear this carefully. If you read Genesis chapter 10 into Genesis chapter 11, where God confused their language. Are you still here? That was the first place where man attempted a conversion of divine technology into earthly technology. So come now, let us burn bricks. So that's when brick building began. Before that time, God's recommendation was stones. That's why we then as lively stones. Till today, stone that God uses to build. Christ, the chief cornerstone. So God still uses stones to build. Oh, Pastor Dami touched that last week, right? <laughs> you should, you should. Ah. So it's stones God uses to build. But when Nimrod was going to rise, Nimrod converted stones to bricks. And I taught this in Lagos. Pastor Dami also spoke about it. I taught this, this in Ecclesia Hills some six, seven months ago. Listen to this carefully. This is the difference. Bricks are created alive. Stones are chiseled differently. No two stones are alike. Uh, yo. Bricks are formed. So they are molded into conformity. That's how Babylon tries. Because that was the, inis that was the initial point called Babel. And God was, he called it Babel to mark a system. And in that system, conformity is necessary to participation. In our system, when God was asking Solomon to build, what he said is lay stone upon stone. He said, and if any stone does not fit, take it to the quarry site. Chisel it at the quarry site that there might not be noise in my house. Oh, yes. So God does not shape us the same, but he shapes us so that we can lap on each other. Are you following me? If I attempt to worship like Abby, I'll just die. I mean, her style. That's why, you notice that when they all finish, I just came and did, in the calm of your presence, I am listening. Because it's not a thunder every day. <laughs> Are you following me? Listen, to expect that she will worship like me is to take us back to bricks. To be stones is to embrace the unique texture of what God is forming and yet be able to tell within it there's only one spirit. And we all are being fitted together as lively stones to build one spiritual house. So let me say the way it will pain you. So if I feel any sense of superiority because of my uniqueness of administration, then I'm a proud fool. Because the uniqueness of my administration should permit a seamless fit of somebody else lapping upon me so that the house can be beautiful. So God does not build in bricks. He laps stones. Follow me. I know where I'm going to. Now, so if you go back to Jericho, what you find as the walls there 
is the Greek technology. Jebus is not Jericho. Because Jebus was surrounded by mountains, man. So it's stones. That means Jebus finds a covenant position. So that when you hear that we will judge the mountains of Esau, you, you got to be careful. So he finds a covenant position and stays there. He reaps of the covenant even though he's not faithful to the covenant. And God will rather have men who are faithful to the covenant reap of the covenant. Listen to this. Just so that your mind doesn't go too far. What does it mean to reap of the covenant? Blessing and honor Glory and power, riches and wisdom and strength. Blessing and honor, glory and power, riches and wisdom and strength be unto you, unto you. Who sits at the right hand of God Be unto you Unto you Who sits at the right hand of God Let me tell you why I sang that song, listen That means every throne belongs to Jesus Every wealth belongs to Jesus. Every glory belongs to Jesus. Every honor belongs to Jesus. So when you hear Caleb David saying things like, There are kings, there are kingdoms, there are mountains and there are thrones. Now listen to this. When you say that they are kings, it's supposed to provoke you. Because they are not supposed to be kings that Yeshua did not choose. But by the fortification of covenant, the moment they are able to ascend to kingship, they enter into a defense position. And even though they lack covenant, covenant has to guide them. So for instance, Ozzy, wealth is a defense. Men have ascended unto wealth that do not honor God. They live in the defense that wealth is. And every time they hear you marching around, I wish somebody heard me. Every time they hear your footsteps going around the walls, they are saying, our blind and our lame. Mm. Maru, there's, there's somebody somewhere who is looking at you and saying, mm, Kai, this young man is trying. He will just give one one billion now. To reduce his voice. What he's thinking is our blind and our lame. Because of what he has attained unto, he say, this church, let poor people have where they can gather and console themselves. And the guy is sitting where he is and he believes that at the snap of a finger, he can get things to happen. I don't know if I can share this publicly. Let me share a portion of it. Recently, I was speaking with somebody in some kind of altercation that preceded, preceded me. Preceded me. I mean, it was an altercation I met. I just inherited the altercation. I, I, didn't, I didn't start it. I didn't fight. And the person called me. And the person was saying, let me tell you the truth. If I want to fight, I'll just go straight to the governor's office. Okay? We have not greeted 
You have not known me. What brought, if I want to fight, I will go straight to the governor's office. There is a sense of defense that status and position gives to people. And when they are there, listen to this, it's, it's replete all over scripture. And once they arrive there, when they look at the sons of, the true sons of covenant, they are looking at you like, our blind and our lame. Because of the power that they hold. Ayah. But only Yeshua will reign forever to his kingdom. We'll get there. We're pushing on to Zion. Only Yeshua will reign forever to his kingdom. There'll be no end. Look at this. So the Jebusites sat in covenant land. And they were looking at Israel. Now, please don't forget that who they were talking about is David. No, no, no. As at this point, David was already king. Wait, 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 wait. Are you still here? That means while David was killing Philistine giants, The Jebusites were hearing the story and were not moved. <laughs> no, 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 you don't, you don't get it. I'm coming, you don't get it. Do you get it? While David was thrashing the Philistines, the Jebusites were sitting inside their mountains. And they still were telling themselves, our blind and our lame will resist David. Please follow me. They were sitting there. It was this same David that they heard, David is determined to take you. They didn't go to prepare for war. The king of the Jebusites said, I'm coming. Let's flip something over before we come back and continue. Sir, we're just reading Psalm 125, right? They that trust in the Lord are as Zion which cannot be moved, but abides forever. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so does the Lord surround his people. Listen to this. People who don't have covenant with God were sitting in the mountains that surround you and had no fear for those who have covenant. You now say you have covenant. And you are living inside Jerusalem afraid. The insult on God is not small. No, you didn't get it. That you are sitting very pretty means that you didn't get it. I'm coming. Ada, people who didn't have covenant were sitting in your covenant space. And they looked at David who had covenant. I said, that lad. You that has covenant that now dwells in Zion. You are sitting there. Then they tell you a man is coming against you and you are quaking. The man who didn't have covenant found your location and his heart didn't quake when a man with covenant was coming against him. You that has covenant are sitting in covenant position. Then they told you that a man without covenant was coming against you and you were afraid. There's no greater insult on Jehovah. It tells you the degree to which the sons of Zion do not know their location and they don't know their covenant. There's a place you get to where you honor men, you respect kings, but you fear nothing. I fear no man. Sometimes it feels like pride. The Lord is my helper. I am not afraid what man can do. That means, no, no, it's not that, oh, they told me somebody is conspiring. It is that my default state is that I cannot be afraid what man can cost you. Please 
please understand this. Oh Lord. Child. Time can be frustrating. So the simple question is, I'll hang it here. I'll take the first teaching in the evening. The question is, do I know Zion? Do I understand the covenant that befalls me because I now live in Zion? Do I understand what it means when God looks at me and says, you are a peculiar treasure to me above all peoples? Because if I don't understand it, what will happen is that I will be in covenant living in a fortified city, but living afraid of everything that happens. Let's find a place to hang this today. Listen to me, saints. It means that one of the earliest signs that you are smelling the doors of Zion is that all fear leaves you. One of the sure signs that you are approaching the doors of Zion is that all kinds of fear leaves you. When they tell you of the conspiracy of men, you bluff it. Listen, when they tell me of the conspiracy of demons, I bluff it. And I say this with all sense of humility. I, I, I sat down with my friends who have said, oh, I entered into certain nations and, you know, uh, and, oh, when I went there, shrines everywhere, altars everywhere. When I even entered my hotel room, I found a shrine somewhere sitting there and I had to tell them, take this thing out, I'll not sleep. I said, hey, if I find a shrine in my hotel room, I will use the God as my pillow. They, they are not born in. There's no God on the earth. No, you don't understand it. All riches are his. The proclamation of scripture is that all of the gods of the nations, they are idols. So I went somewhere and I was going to buy an artifact. Then somebody said to me, ah, be careful, though. That it might be a representation of a God found in Zion. If a city has technologies, Zion has technologies. If a city has a king, Zion has a king. So you see, what we do in temple worship is to acknowledge the king of Zion. But listen to this. If we acknowledge the king of Zion and do not obey the establishment of his kingdom, then we never knew the king we came to. You are the king of Zion. Judas fly rain Jesus rain Jesus rain rain Jesus rain you are the king of Zion to Say it again, rain Jesus, rain Jesus, rain, rain Jesus, rain, rain Jesus, rain. Oh, you are the King of Zion.
can favor Zion. Uh, he said, for the time to favor her has come. Yea, the set time is when? Now, that's Psalm 95, right? That's Psalm 95? Huh? Or 105? No. Psalm 102. 102. Psalm 102. Look at what he said there. He said, Thou shall arise, verse 13, and have mercy upon Zion. For the time to favor her has come. Yea, the set time is now. Why? For thy servants take pleasure in her stones. He said, and they favor the dust of Zion. Then see what verse 15 says. So the heathen will fear the name of the Lord. And what? Oh my God. No, you didn't hear me. And the heathen will fear the name of the Lord and all the kings of the earth. That means it is not Zion until the heathen is afraid. It is not Zion until the kings of the earth tremble. They fear his glory. Then see God's only delay, verse 16. He said, for when the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. That means if the kings of the earth are not trembling, God is still building Zion. Oh, I wish you heard me. I wish you heard me. I wish you heard me. Now, God is still building Zion does not mean that God is in a bricklaying walk. Because you are come unto Mount Zion, the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem. That means Zion is already there. It's a heavenly reality. But it tells you that if the people who are called to assemble unto Zion do not understand the implication of standing in Zion, then what happens is that the end of God, which is causing the kings of the earth to quake, cannot happen because those who are supposed to represent that reality are still afraid they're still living in less than the understanding of the reality to which they have been called for we are come unto Mount Zion the city of the living God that when the church becomes conscious of what it has been called into our sphere and our influence will never be personal it will shake the nations. So when God says Zion, what he's actually saying is, can you give me my firstborn? I'll speak to you about the firstborn in the evening. What God is saying is, give me my firstborn. Because the firstborn is the priest. Yes, the firstborn is the priest. And I am the priest. And I show you a priest. That's why I said he separates us as a peculiar people unto him and makes us a kingdom of priests. What God said when he was cons consecrating the Levitical tribe is that he said, the day I killed the firstborns in Egypt, all your firstborns belong to me. That means you need to consider your firstborn too dead. Oh, I'm coming. That means the day I killed the firstborn of Egypt, your firstborns too died. All your firstborns too died. That means no family has the right to a firstborn. Then God said, instead of gathering firstborns from all family, give me the tribe of Levi. And I studied it in the book of Numbers, Pastor Hosey, and I found out that the number of the Levites was almost equal to the number of the firstborns in Israel. He said, 21,170. 21,170. The difference, so it was almost like God was saying, I'm taking the tribe that is equal to the number of the first priests. So that being a priest was not actually about being a Levite. It was about being conscious of being the firstborn. And the firstborn is the heir. That means the quicker I become conscious that I'm supposed to inherit the earth. The Bible said concerning Abraham, Romans chapter 4, that the promise that he should be the inheritor of the world. 
That means when you rise up. Why the earth is not provoking is because you are looking for a person. You are not saying, this is my father's world. You cannot do that in my father's world. Hamas cannot attack Israel in my father's world. Russia cannot attack Ukraine in my father's world. When you start to feel the sense of my father's world, not, oh, thank God the war is not reaching Nigeria. Nigeria, we should be thanking God, oh, we don't even have war. It's just more Boko Haram. And they are chasing us one day. At least six of us are dying with bomb. No, that's not the mentality. The mentality is this is my father's world. I'm here to administrate it on his behalf. When you start to arrive at those levels of thoughts, you are approaching Zion. You are the king of Zion. You are Zion. The moment Zion is spoken, that's why they said by the rivers of Babylon we sat down and wept. When we remembered Zion. Listen, it was not all of Israel that was at the rivers of Babylon. Abbey. The Bible said in Daniel chapter 1 that Nebuchadnezzar said, choose of their princes and their kings such that should serve. So the people they brought into captivity who sat at the rivers of Babylon were princes and kings. So Babylon knows that you have covenant. Only you does not know that you have covenant. And they know that if they take advantage of the covenant on your head, you will be building a system that is anti-God. But only if they knew that sitting in Babylon is getting set to bring down the gods of Babylon and cause them to bow before the one true God. Because Nebuchadnezzar before he died said, let no God be worshipped in all of the provinces of Babylon except the God of Daniel. If the provocation of representing Zion does not re register into you, then what happens is that when these great vessels, whether in-house or our guests, lead us to worship, you will be standing before the God of Zion, but you don't have the intelligence that decodes the things that Zion should give you, so that when you turn, you can subdue the earth. Because out of Zion, the perfection of beauty at God shine. Today I say to you, you are Zion. You are the city of God. It is from you he wants to proceed and fill the earth. Lift up your hand where you are and for the next two minutes, pray in the Holy Spirit and register. This is my father's world. Register it. This is my father's world. Register it. This is my father's world. Just register it in your mind. This is my father's world. Register it. This is my father's world. Tell him. Tell, tell your depths. This is my father's world. I did not only come here to sing good worship songs. No, 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 no. That's not the reason why I came. While I adore him, it's so that I can draw strength from him to administrate the world on his behalf. This is my father's world. Come on, I thought believers will be praying somewhere. I thought believers will be praying somewhere. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, can we take advantage of the next five minutes? Let's take advantage of the next five minutes. Parando Kesiata. Yes, a paranda gadataya nate. Rakabakose kiala sadaya. Rapabose kedia pananate. This is my father's world. And to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings. The music of the spheres. Pray it until it registers in your mind. Satan has no right not to glory, not to honor, not to riches, not to wealth, not to wisdom, 
not to strength. Everything that is attributed to God is supposed to be an exclusive preserve of Zion. This is my father's world. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas. His hands the wonders rock. Ole Bacaradosiana. This is my father's world. The birds their carols raise. The morning light, the lily white, declare their maker's praise. Koti barana magado seti ataya. The morning light, the lily white, declare their maker's praise. This is my father's world. He shines in all that fear in the rustling grass i hear him pass he speaks to me everywhere in the rustling grass i hear him pass speaks to me everywhere. That I will not only rise from Zion feeling mercy. I will not rise from Zion only because I had a worship experience. No, in that, in the rustling grass, I hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. He's not only speaking to me everywhere, he's speaking about everything. He's speaking about the rulership of the earth. He's speaking about the covenants of the nations. He's speaking about the scepter that abides. This is the place where the limitations in your mind, they break open to make room for the things God wants to do in and through you. In the rustling grass, I hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. This is my father's work. Oh, let me never forget that though the wrong seem up so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my father's work. Oh, let me never forget that though the wrong seems so so strong God is the ruler yet this is my father's world why should my heart be sad the Lord is king let heaven ring God reigns let the earth be glad this is my father's world why should my heart be sad the lord is king let heavens ring god reigns let the earth rejoice the lord is king let the heavens ring god reigns let the earth rejoice the lord is let the heavens ring. God reigns, let the earth. It's my father's world. Children cannot be sleeping hungry. It's my father's world. Poverty must be broken in it. It is my father's world. Nobody should live perpetually in sin. It's my father's world. Righteousness and justice must prevail here. It's my father's world. Zion is the height, the mountain where the king sits. Zion is the height, it's the mountain where the king sits. Kodibala Ariana Sote, Shebalon Diabakarana. The Lord is king. 
Let heaven free. Courage, let the earth be glad. The Lord is king. Let heaven free. Courage, let the earth be glad. The Lord is king. Let the heaven free. This is the gospel of the kingdom. This is the gospel of the kingdom. In the kingdom, the king is exalted, but the people live well. The Lord is king, let the heavens ring. Courage, let the earth be glad. The Lord is king, let the heavens ring. Courage, let the earth be glad. The Lord is King, let the heavens ring. Courage, let the earth be glad. The Lord is King, let heavens ring. Lord, we are Zion. We are the city of the living God. We arise to the consciousness that this is your world. You said to Israel, I'll make you a peculiar treasure above all nations, for the earth is mine. Lord, in every place where we have become complacent about the events of the earth, have mercy upon us and stir up our hearts again to understand that there's no separation between the presence and the things that happen on earth. That the essence of the presence is that we might represent you. Lord, help our hearts to never rest until we see the fullness of the manifestation of your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. So together we declare, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, together we declare, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, let these three days not just create in us a good feeling. Let it rest upon our shoulders the mark of your responsibility. The mark that sets us as kings in the earth on behalf of our supreme commander, the king of all kings. We bless you, our Father. We thank you for the blessedness of your presence. We rise from here. We are Zion, the city of the living God. Blessed be your name, Father. In Jesus' name, and the church shouts, Amen. Amen.